All right, welcome everybody. I think we've got everything working. Thanks so much for joining me for this free webinar. Um, we've got tons of stuff to cover and it's gonna be a lot. And you guys who are here with me live, make sure you chat with me, let me know um, what you think, how you, any questions you have as we go. And I'm going to be jumping back and forth between the questions and what we're talking about. So anybody else who happens to catch the recording after the fact, feel free to stay in touch with me and let me know your questions too and anything I can do to help because I wanna know what you want to hear about so I can do more free stuff. So uh, stay in touch and let's get going. So tonight we are talking about Yes, I really do want you to chat with me, Brandy, <laughs> even though you're right here. Um, you guys who were not here before I hit record can uh, just be alerted that I have a live audience tonight. Uh, it's one of you from the actual dog training community who has um, stalked me long enough to become my friend. <laughs> and <laughs> she lives. Way to that. Yes, that was a great way to phrase that. Um, so she lives in Georgia and I'm back in, at my house in Florida temporarily. So she is crashing and she's like, I'm coming now. And she arrived she's here so she's uh she i'm doing and she knew i was doing this class and she was like so i actually get to watch you in person instead of on the screen because i exist in real life so um do you really i do so everybody can welcome brandy to my my uh room here uh, so what we're talking about tonight is three steps for ending burnout and how to still keep making more money even if you are not burning out so we have uh, a lot of things to cover. First of all, this kind of goes along with a free workshop that is going on right now, which is up at makeitasadogtrainer.com at the time of recording this right now on Friday night. This mini workshop goes on through the end of the week, next week. So make sure you get in there to watch that because I go into a little bit more detail about the things we're talking about tonight in that free workshop. So it gives you a bunch of checklists and downloads that you can go through to apply a lot of these things. But tonight we're mainly focusing specifically on the things that you can do that will help you make more and, and work less. And that's a lot of what the mini workshop focuses on too is making more without having to work as hard. Especially right now, it seems like during this time of year, just after summer, which usually tends to be busier for most dog trainers anyway, it's also after kind of a weird year where everybody, a lot of you were more busy than usual. And uh, if you're undercharging or if you're not getting the clients that you most enjoy, you can burn out really fast. And that is, has always been a problem for dog trainers is that once they do start getting enough clients, if I start talking about how to get more clients, that would kind of be like, oh, I don't really want more clients because I'm already spread so thin, but I do need to make more money. You know, so I'll get a lot of times contacted by trainers who are like, I really want to, you know, increase my income. But when I ask them more questions, they seem like reluctant to just be getting more clients because they already are just, you know, just spread too thin, just too busy. So how do you do both? How do you get more, you know, make more money without having to work as hard? And that's a lot of what we're talking about. And that actually, it's funny because the things that you have to do to avoid burning out would be the same things you should do if you're struggling because you will be, it'll be so much easier to get out of the struggle if you are doing things this way, which is going to be the same thing that helps you prevent burning out. So here is, let me get the back over here. Here are the things we're gonna talk about. The things that will help you double or more your income. That is what is consistent among the trainers who apply these things. So this is not uncommon for that to happen. It's not just a rare type of, um, outcome for the things we're talking about. And I'll show you some examples, uh, but it is something that you can kind of expect to happen if you apply things you know, completely and quickly. And of course, like I said, if you go to the marketing mini workshop up at makeitasadogtrainer.com, you'll get even deeper ideas and ways of implementing everything you're gonna hear tonight. So even though this is a very short webinar, we're gonna cover a lot of like the big principles and some of the how to's, there's more how to's in those videos. So I won't leave you hanging if you're not real sure exactly how to apply it. You'll also be able to have more time off and not get to the point of hating your business or hating people and your clients or hating dogs or burning out, which is basically all those things. <laughs> you hush, you people hater. <laughs> if you guys saw my post in the big Facebook group about personality um, types, I cannot think of words tonight, personality types. I was really not surprised, but actually a little delighted to find out that most of the personality types in the dog trainer marketing group are the form of introverts that least like people, but it happens to be the personality type that most likes me. 
and that's all that matters. So um, we're going to be silly a little bit once in a while here. So you guys who don't know me, my name is Molly and I am the creator of makeitasadogtrainer.com. I am a little bit on the silly side, which I, which is apparently genetic because as you can see from these pictures of my kids and we are um, a traveling family that likes to do a lot of underwater things. So I am in Florida now, but I'm not always, I was in Australia for a while and then other, many other places. So I'm always joining from a different time zone. Right now, most of you guys are on the same time zone as me being Friday night. Uh, but we have been traveling just during the time, the past several years that we've been teaching dog trainers how to get more clients. During and overlapping that time, we had a dog training business in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. So before we had, we're just teaching other dog trainers for the past uh, almost 10 years, overlapping that time for about 14 years, I had a dog training business. So during that time that I was training dogs from the time I was uh, in my like mid early twenties, I uh, lived in New Jersey and we had um, a lot of great struggles and successes in the very early stages of our dog training business. So when I say R, I mean my husband and me, he was actually uh, teaching art, elementary art part-time and I was working in an office and I hated it. So I started a dog training business once I stumbled upon that as an option. And um, one of my first clients, I'll tell you this, this great story. One of my first clients during my time of studying marketing in the very early part of my business, because I've always been a marketing nerd, um, my attempt early on was to figure out how to get high-end clients because living in New Jersey, I lived near places where um, there were a lot of wealthy people, very affluent areas and neighborhoods. So one of these families that I got as a high-end client was a family in New York City and I hated going to the city. I hated, I'm just not a city person. I hated going to New York. So we lived in New Jersey, which was already a big culture shock for me because I grew up in South Carolina and moved to New Jersey when Jason and I got married because that's where he's from. And uh, so I was dry, I had to go into New York City the first time I drove, the second time I parked somewhere in New Jersey and took the train. And uh, I get to the, the client's apartment. They, they basically were like the type of people who probably would have paid anything, but I felt like maybe this is my in and my, you know, my lucky time here where I'd get in with somebody who has a lot of money and maybe they could refer me out to all of their other dog owning friends that have a lot of money that live on the you know, Upper East Side. Um, so I get to the apartment on the Upper East Side on Park Avenue, I think. I don't remember the city that well. And um, their apartment was PHC. And I was like, that's a weird apartment number. And I realized when I got there that that stood for penthouse C. So I was escorted by the doorman to the apartment and they were a very, very nice family, but this was, I'm, you know, Upper East Side Park Avenue, three story apartment at the top of this building. And it was, I mean, it was bigger than probably all of the houses I've ever lived in combined. It was huge walk in, I feel completely out of place. Like I'm just not a fancy person. I almost never wear shoes. Like it's just, <laughs> I, I always I have, <laughs> I, I always have very colorful leggings on. Like I'm just very laid back and chill. So I'm just, I feel very out of place. It was very, very fancy. There's gold stuff everywhere. There's beautiful wood everywhere. There's huge like Oriental rugs everywhere. And there's um, this gorgeous, gorgeous golden retriever named Samantha that walks up to me and I'm in this is the dog that I'm going to be training and I do everything out of their apartment they normally don't they would come to me but they paid extra for me to go to them so of course so I'm talking to the the owner in one of her many living rooms on this huge massive um penthouse apartment and while I'm talking to the owner I don't even remember her name but I remember the dog's name Samantha Samantha farted during the lesson very loud enough to scare herself. And she turned and looked at her own butt as she farted. And the owner was mortified, <laughs> absolutely mortified. She looked at the dog and she goes, oh, Samantha, you are a lady. <laughs> and I just lost it. You know, I was like 23, you know, and I just, I thought it was the most hysterical thing. And I just couldn't even barely continue. And it happened again. She did the exact same thing and I lost it again. So this, client was supposed to be my in with all of these high-end clients. 
And uh, she did end up referring me out to several people. Um, but I learned over time that actually a high-end client is not just a person that lives in a penthouse apartment that has a, a really gorgeous dog and all these beautiful things and would be offended over her dog passing gas during the lesson. What is actually a high-end client is someone who is, who is um, just like all your current clients. All your current clients could be high-end clients people just like you, people just like me, people just like all of us. And let me just go on to the next slide because I feel like you've been looking at my diving pictures forever. So here are some examples of just some of the stories that I just happened to already have in slides. I have tons of them. Um, so you might've seen a couple of these before if you've been on webinars with me in the past, but this one was uh, an example where she says, imagine making just under $20,000 per month training only four dogs a month and booking a month out and more importantly, loving it, not burning out and how that reflects to your clients who can't wait to refer you. That is someone who had done my, one of my workshops a while back. And here's another one. She said, I recently sold two pro programs that blew my socks off, one for $39.95 and one for $46.95. I'll say one thing, if it wasn't for Molly's uh, make it as a dog trainer, I wouldn't be living my dream of being a full-time dog trainer. When she says it works, it does. Thank you, Molly. Um, so I asked her, I sent her a message when she posted that. And I said, can you remind me, didn't you used to charge something like $25 a day for board and train? And she said, yes, I would get $600 a month. So that was the change that she had going from that $600 a month, charging $25 a day to these four and $5,000 programs. She just sent me a message a couple days ago that said, well, you're not going to believe this. And I was like, what? And she goes, I had a $10,000 a month last month. Um, and, uh, you know, I congratulated her and everything, but she has gone through many ups and downs in her business. And that was something that she wanted everyone to know. This is Tim. A lot of you guys know, Tim, Tim is one of my favorite people. I got to work with him privately as well, but he went through one of my workshops called the program creation workshop, which is what PCW stands for. And he went from 450 a client to 24, 25 a client on average. And there's a really big reason why that's so important because as um, you guys, again, who don't know me, my biggest thing that I love teaching is teaching dog trainers how to make more per client, because that is one of the things that makes the biggest difference. You will not necessarily always only have expensive programs, so you can still help, you know, pretty much everyone in your area who would need it regardless of their budget, but it's really important to be able to offer things that people really want that are higher end and be able to know how to do that. So let's talk about the reasons why you might be burning out. Might be just because you're getting clients that aren't that great, you know, bad clients, too many clients, too much work, your programs are too long, maybe you don't have any boundaries and you try to take care of everyone at the same time so you don't have a wait list, you um, think that people won't wait for you if you do have some kind of wait list, you might think um, that they need as much as possible right now or that you need as much as possible right now in clients because you're making up for a slow time earlier in the year, like when everything's shut down. Maybe you're homeschooling your kids like I do, like everyone, everyone has been forced into my schedule. <laughs> you know, I have three kids and I homeschool them and run the business from home. Everybody's kind of been forced into that, but maybe you are burning out because your current dog training programs, especially if you want something that's higher value and more expensive, you think that automatically means longer and bigger and more lessons and, you know, longer stay for a board and train program or something. But you can fix all of those things with basically the same solution. So I'm going to give you the steps that you need. The first one is the ab absolute first thing you need to do in order to get out of burnout or prevent it or fix any struggles that you're having is to focus not on getting more clients, but to focus on getting fewer clients and making more per person. So here is an example of that. So here is this wonderful couple that I know. This is Crystal and Eric. Nearman. They are also in the big dog training marketing group. So a lot of you guys know that know these guys. This, this is their kids and our kids. <laughs> I got to meet them in person last September and uh, we went out to dinner together and they are just as much crazy fun as we are. And that was everybody told to do a silly face. So you can see Jason there. That was the best he could do at a silly face. <laughs> so that was a silly face for him. Usually he looks like a cardboard cutout and nobody thinks he actually exists. Um, including Brandy, who now has actual proof, right? Yeah, he does yeah, actually exist. <laughs> so this is Crystal's spreadsheet that she sent me years ago when I first met her. 
So she did a workshop with me uh, years and years ago. She used to make, I don't know if you guys can see this, back in 2012, her whole, her entire income for the whole year was over just over $7,500. The next year it was just over $9,800. The year after that, it was third, over $38,000. And the year after that, it was $93,000 and change. The difference between the third column and the, the one at the top was 10 times the income, about 9,000 to over 90,000. The number of clients was 47 to 55. So if you can imagine when it comes to making more or make, yeah, making more in your dog training business without working harder in general, just by itself, just to make enough, just to get by and just to make it and have a consistent income. It's so much easier to attract, you know, 55 clients in a, in a year than it is to attract 470 in a year. So if she had 10 times her income, but didn't increase her, her average income per client, she would have had to attract 470 or more, you know, about 500 clients in a year. It's a lot easier to, to make $10,000 in a month by getting 10 $1,000 clients than it is to get however many, you know, $100 clients. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been supposed to help me with my math since you're here. Um, so yeah, it's just so much easier to reach your income goals by charging more and getting fewer people. You don't have to advertise as much. You don't have to spend as much on marketing. You don't have to talk to as many people. You don't have to, <laughs> I just winked at you, the people hater. Um, you don't have to do as many consults. You don't have to, um, just everything is easier. Don't have to answer the phone as much, all that stuff. If you're just focusing on being able to make more per person. So you can see her average income per client between these years went from $208 to over $1,700. So how did she do that? And how have all these other trainers whose stories you see in here and you see more of them and examples and everything in the mini workshop up at make it as a dog trainer.com. How did they do that? Well, the first thing is that you need to make sure that you know how to package your dog training programs so that regular people will spend more money on them, that you can get high end clients from your regular clients, the ones that you are currently getting now, that they would be willing to spend 10 times as much or twice as much or five times as much or whatever. As long as you know how to package what you're offering, it's so much easier to do that. So that's why that's always the first thing I work on with dog trainers when, especially one-on-one -on -one, is changing what they're actually offering. Almost all of the dog trainers I work with, that's the first thing they have to work on is changing what they actually offer because what you have for sale directly influences how much money you make. So how do you do that? The first and the biggest principle out of everything that you need to know is how to package what you offer in terms of whether or not you are just packaging your time. That's the number one mistake of every kind of service business really is just charging for your time rather than charging for the benefit of working with you. So let me explain. Almost everybody starts off charging by the session or by the hour or selling packages of sessions. Meaning like, you know, I, I can come and work with you as needed and you pay as you go, or, you know, it's a certain amount per session and you do, you're, you have to do a minimum of four and then see how it goes and pay more, do more if you need to. Or <laughs> she's distracting me. Um, or you, no such thing. <laughs> she, she has a stuffed animal bat that I gave her that she's throwing in the air. Um, and this is why I didn't let my eight year old in here, but she's doing it now. Or you will charge in packages of lessons. Like you'll do, you know, one lesson for 200 or a pack of four lessons for 650. And then it's at a discount. And when you do that, what's happening basically in the minds of your prospects is they are viewing it like they are paying for your time. They are paying just for those hours or those sessions and they, the outcome may or may not be. They might get the benefits, they might not. You might even reassure them that they'll definitely be able to get their goals that they told you about reached in that amount of time. And there's a whole bunch of downsides to that. Everything from the fact that you were only selling what they need and not giving them an option of spending more for things they might want. And you're just customizing programs based on what they told you their goals are. And they have that one choice and they can't spend twice as much if they want more attention from you or more exclusivity or bonuses or lifetime support or any other thing that they might really want or prefer to get from you. But the number one mistake here is just packaging what you offer and undercharging because you are charging based on your time. 
and you're just doing by the lesson or by the hour. So that is the first thing you have to make sure you're not doing. Even if you know, or you have already figured out how to kind of package what you offer in, in the form of programs, which is one of the big things that you learn in the, the marketing workshop, the free one that's up at make it as a dog trainer, uh, dot com. Even if you're doing that, your programs might still be more like a package where it's kind of being presented as just a collection of time. And people just don't value that. They don't really care how much time you spend. They care their dog will actually just start listening and stop jumping on people and dragging them down the street. So it's much easier to charge what you're worth and be able to make a lot more per person and not burn out if you are charging for outcomes and benefits rather than charging for your time. So to know how to apply that, make sure you watch part two of the mini workshop. So that will give you a lot of resources on how to do that. Step three is to keep your boundaries a little bit more, which is something that all nice people struggle with and even people who are not nice. Um, when you don't have any kind of work life boundaries going on with, you know, you stop answering calls at certain times, you take days off, you schedule time for yourself and your own dogs and your family, that will obviously make you burn out. But even in addition to that, you need to have boundaries when it comes to waitlisting people. So if you're getting a lot of you guys who got super busy this year because of the you know pandemic puppies and everything, um, you, a lot of you guys just started taking everybody as soon as you could. You know, like you got ten clients in one month, and you usually would only have four. You just took them all, and you did ten clients every week, and you just went to all the lessons every week, and you just you know or more, however many you could get, you just did them all at once instead of making people wait because you were afraid they wouldn't wait or you'd afraid they'd flake out on you or find somebody who was available sooner or something like that. Or maybe you've even had that happen. So here is how you properly wait list people so that you don't burn out. So this is a big thing, a big skill, big important thing you need to know how to do. So when you do get busier, even when you are getting more higher end clients and just you know higher value clients, clients that are willing to pay you more for your time and for your programs and, and everything that you're going to be learning how to do, you'll need to know how to tell people what your availability is and not go beyond that. Because this is, again, all about how to prevent burning out. If you don't have any boundaries with this, you will just be tempted to just take it all as soon as you can out of fear that it won't be there if you don't. So here's what you need to do. When someone says, yes, I want to go for this program, I want to do this thing, then you say, that's great. Um, my next availability for this program is this time. And you put it at the end of your other programs. You know, once you've reached your bandwidth of what comfortable doing in a month and you're filled up for that month, you put them into the next month or at the end and you have them give you a non-refundable deposit. So they fill out an enrollment form of some kind with their name, the dog's information and everything. They sign a little thing that says, you know, $200 is due at the, at the time of signing up. It's non-refundable and um, it applies toward the rest of the program. The rest of the program is paid, uh, is due at the beginning of the program. So that way they don't go home and rethink their decision. They're already committed. It's non-refundable. It keeps people from flaking out on you and being like, yes, let's go. And then going home and being like, maybe there's a, I can get the same value from somewhere else. Do we really need it? Maybe we can try training our dogs ourselves for a little while. It keeps them from going into that second guessing mode because the decision's made, they can just be excited and wait and move on. So you might not think people are willing to do that. If you have a super long wait list, like I, I have a, a friend who I worked with, um, a dog trainer in Canada that for quite a while had a very long wait list. So like months. So she would tell people when she, they first contacted her so that she wouldn't spring it on them after they said, yes, let's go. I'm ready to sign up. She would say, um, you know, tell me all about your dog. She'd listen to them. She'd reassure them that they, she could help. And she'd say, okay, I just want to let you know my next availability for a program is not until, you know, February. Um, so if you'd like, I would love to meet with you and tell you all about the programs. And, and if you decide you, that one of them feels like the best fit for you, then I'll put you in at my next availability. Otherwise, I can put you in touch with a dog trainer who has availability now. And almost always, those dog owners would say, no, that's fine, I'll wait. And I'll go ahead and meet with you, or at least find out the information first and go ahead and wait. And they would wait a lot of the time because honestly, just psychologically, they'd think, well, if you were you know, booked until February and this other trainer is available now, 
you must be better, <laughs> you know? So you have to know how to say it in a way that makes it, um, makes them kind of come to that conclusion without actually saying that. But that is exactly basically how she said it. Um, so the biggest thing here is that if you get to a certain point, you got to figure out what your bandwidth is and what you're comfortable with, with your schedule, schedule your time off, make that like sacred. Don't let people ha make you do lessons on those days. Those are your days off your book that day. You know, if you decide Mondays and Tuesdays is your weekend and somebody's like, you know, oh, I'd really love to sign up with you, but I'm only off on Mondays. You know, if you take it away, people will find a way. <laughs> You know, they, they suddenly become available on Wednesday. You know, you have to set your boundaries and stick to it that your days off are your sacred times and you don't let people mess that up. And once you get to a certain point where you're full, you start taking non-refundable deposits and you put them in at the back. And that helps kind of give you some predictability in your income too. That's one of the biggest mistakes I made during times of struggle. Um, during the kind of fin financial crisis that went on during like the 2009, 2010 timeframe, we had this major struggle with income and we had a huge amount of expenses unexpectedly because of some family stuff and which is a whole other long story and a uh, big international <laughs> dramas and attorneys and, and all, all kinds of things were going on. It was just crazy. So we had almost all of our life savings wiped out and the economy collapsed and we couldn't afford hardly, you know, ramen noodles for a while. So I went to a marketing conference because that's what I do when I'm broke. I go learn more marketing stuff. So I went to a marketing conference and they gave this advice that if you don't have it for sale, they can't buy it. So the first thing you need to go home and do is create this big program that that way and just offer it alongside what you're already offering. You know, this big program that has all the things that your ideal client might value, put it all in one program and offer it next to the other things that you already have. So I went home and did that. And the very next client I got had two dogs that signed up for my brand new $3,500 program. So it was a $7,000 client right out of the gate as soon as I got home from this conference. Um, and this wasn't even a marketing conference for dog trainers, it was another industry. And I just applied it to the dog training business. So got home, did that, got this great big client, ended up in that month getting $20,000 of signups when we previously, the previous month, were just basically barely, barely covering anything, just completely broke. And uh, this is even after me studying marketing for years. So I just needed like this big idea. Um, so that worked really well. But my mistake was that I over, well, over, over, overloaded my schedule during that month to handle those $20,000 worth of dogs. And it wasn't something that was sustainable permanently. Like I could get all those dogs trained in that one month, but it would have been really hard to keep up with that because it was a long, big program that I was selling. And um, so I needed, I needed to spread things out a little bit more. So over time, I made that program shorter and more expensive and started waitlisting people. So it'd be much more consistent. And then I would know if I had things booked out two or three months that I could count on a certain amount of income in the future months. And it would give me a bit of a breathing room coming up on winter time. I could kind of prepare a little bit better. It just had so many benefits. So you have to be able to have those boundaries in addition to knowing how to package what you offer and in addition to um, making sure you're focusing on not just getting more clients, but getting better clients, getting higher paying clients. By the way, if one of the reasons you're burning out is because you are getting difficult clients that are big pains in the butt that are like um, very entitled and bossy and don't listen and they don't do their homework and all that stuff, you will tend to get much better clients if you charge more. The more they pay, the more invested they are, and the more they tend to respect your time. And that's just naturally the way it tends to go. So if you're focusing on just getting, you know, affluent high-end clients, that may not be the case. If you are focusing on getting high-end clients from your current ideal client base of regular, I, I shouldn't compare wealthy people to regular people, but you guys know what I mean. Like, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with wealthy people. Even that, even Samantha's owner was a wonderful person. You know, there's, I, I, I you know, some of my best friends are wealthy. <laughs> it's very inappropriate, but um, yeah, it's your regular clients that you get now who currently object to $200 programs can still be $2,000 clients if you know how to package what you offer and know how to describe it, know how to talk about them, know how to talk to people, know how to listen. All of those are skills that I love to help with. And those are all things that are talked a lot about in the, the crash course, the marketing crash course up at makeitasadogtrainer.com. So make sure you go watch that. It's free. It's up for another few days. 
So make sure you do that. Um, there's also, just so you guys know who've never done it before, the program creation workshop that has been referenced in the other workshop in, the, in the, um, those posts that I showed you before is part of the marketing boot camp. So that is opening on Monday. So you guys who are watching this now, Friday night, got a couple days, um, but just write down that website link. That's where it's going to be on Monday. As of right now, it's not open yet. So make sure you just go watch the, all the free stuff up right here. So those are the big things that help to prevent burnout. And again, all the details on actually how to do it are a lot of details and examples and, and worksheets and everything are in the mini workshop there. So make sure you go do that. Uh, let me hit these questions here. And you guys keep giving me questions. Now we'll do the Q&A part. So Janet says, I would love to know how much people charge for board and training. I charge $500 a week with two week minimum. Lately, people are canceling because of loss of job and holidays. Okay. <clears throat> Great question. <laughs> Brandy says, do you want me to chat with you from two feet away? Yes, you can still do that. <laughs> so great. Yeah, I miss, I, I totally forgot that I already read that. Good so job. I'm messing, I'm answering it again. <laughs> that was the big, that was what the big smile was for. I was like, oh yeah, I did this already. Um, so <laughs> Janet, so charging $500 a week with a two week minimum. So when you are charging for just the, the weeks, it is basically the same exact thing as charging for by the hour if you were doing just private lessons. So you are just charging like just a straight like, uh, okay, here's your problems. I think it'll take a week to fix if it takes an extra week or you know, I think it two weeks is a minimum. If it takes more time, then it takes more time. And then what ends up happening is they view it as you know, a certain amount per day certain amount per week, which they will then take and compare with other dog trainers and say, well, how much does that dog trainer charge per week? Your, your quality might be a thousand times better and you might be able to get so much more done in two weeks than another trainer, but you're almost accidentally training them to look at it as like, let me go compare based on a cost per piece, cost per week, cost per hour, cost per day, all that. So it's going to end up devaluing your time and becomes more of a um, which trainer is cheaper sort of decision which is definitely not the way you want your, your clients making that decision. So that's one thing. The second thing is, is that if you are charging uh, $500 a week with a two week minimum and packaging it just as, you know, here are the weeks that I think you need, pay this much money. Um, if they think of it as, uh, you know, two week minimum and if we need more time, you gotta pay more money, then they tend to um, be a little bit distrustful of that. Like, well, what if you are kind of slow and then you come back at me halfway through and say, oh, I'm going to need two extra weeks and now it's twice as much money. It just makes people a little bit nervous to make the decision as well. So your $500 a week is not uh, necessarily the, the problem with what you're charging. And it's good to know kind of what other trainers charge per week when they do break down their, their prices on a per week amount, you know, when they figure it out, um, what they're actually charging people. But the presentation, when you're presenting it to your dog training clients and prospects, shouldn't be based on the cost per week. So make sure you go again, watch that mini workshop so you know how to package it so that it is, um, you know, a two week program that achieves these outcomes, you know, you describe the outcomes, you know, what kind of typically you can get from the most common ideal client and you describe that outcome well about what's common among your most most common ideal clients describe that's what happens usually in two weeks so the two weeks just kind of becomes incidental it's this outcome for this much money you know about a thousand dollars or whatever which by the way i think is too cheap for a two-week program so i'm going to get to that next and um it happens to include a two-week stay so it's the time is kind of a, uh, a side point. It's the outcome that they're paying for. You're like this, the program, these are the kinds of things you can achieve. Your dog is doing these things now, not listening, pulling, jumping, barking. Imagine if instead your dog walks right next to you, um, stays on their bed while you eat dinner, all this, all this stuff that you do during this two week program, typically you describe that you say this program includes a two week stay at the trainer's home or you know, facility or whatever. Um, so then it's not the time that you're selling. That's just kind of how the program works. What you're selling is the outcome. So that's the first thing, which again, you'll learn a lot more about in the mini workshop if you're watching that. But um, $1,000 for two weeks is quite inexpensive compared to most trainers, at least the ones who've done my workshops. Um, I, for example, have, let me just think of some examples. Um, a trainer that I worked with 
who has, I think, a two-week board and train program that is about 3,700 and a four-week one that's, I think, over 5,000 and includes like lifetime support and stuff like that, more bonuses and things like that. Um, that's not to say that that's necessarily what you should charge, but I just want to give you a little bit more of an idea of the potential of what people are willing to pay. And it does depend quite a lot on your abilities as a trainer in terms of how quickly you can do certain things. And everybody's you know, comfort level with that kind of stuff is, um, is different. Um, so what you can actually accomplish in a certain amount of time will affect your prices because that's really the way it should be is that, you know, the, the trainers who do uh, more in less time should actually be more expensive. So the time is more valuable because they can do more in that amount of time. Right. So it's not just the time itself that's expensive. It's the actual quality of, you know, the benefits that, it, that makes the program more expensive. So I hope that helps give you some, some, uh, um, direction with that, it'll be much easier to get people to number one, stop canceling. If you get a non-refundable deposit, you know, they might have to postpone it because they don't have the money to pay for the rest right now, but they won't just flake on you entirely. They'll be much less likely to, if you take a non-refundable deposit when they sign up. And number two, you'll probably get less flakes if you're charging more and you'll be able to charge more. If you really study how to put it together, how to describe the program, and you know what should be included make sure you pay close attention to part two of the free mini workshop and part three which is all about your sales process how to actually describe what you're doing um and how to or how to how to sell basically how to have the selling conversation in a really comfortable way that helps people see the value of what you do so i hope that helps uh carly says how do you handle having wait lists for puppies when the pup will continue to age and develop while they're waiting I have to uh, jump off now, but thank you. I'll look forward to the recording. Okay, so Carly, thanks for being here earlier. And, and this uh, is the answer to your question for when you catch the recording. So your uh, wait list when you have puppies, it's, it is a little bit trickier if they're sign, signing up for a puppy program. So kind of backtracking a little bit, the way a lot of trainers will tend to do their puppy programs, especially after they have gone through these workshops and they, they've packaged their adult programs in different ways and they're more um, higher value and priced better and they're not undercharging anymore, is that they will tend to take puppy programs as just kind of a almost upgraded slightly version of their adult programs. So they will sell their adult programs to these clients with like a couple extra hundred dollars added to the price. They won't say it's this plus $200. They'll just give them the higher price and they'll throw in a couple extra lessons before the dog is old enough for the full program. So if you normally do your adult programs at let's say 20 weeks and older, then you can go ahead and take this client who has a dog that's you know 12 weeks old, eight weeks old and say, um, so here I'm gonna tell you about the programs. Um, what I'll do for you since your dog isn't quite old enough to begin and because I have a wait list is I'll go ahead and put you on the wait list for our next availability. And in the meantime, we'll do a couple of Zoom lessons to cover puppy stuff. And you just kind of throw a couple extra um, virtual lessons or in-person lessons or phone lessons or whatever <laughs> in to cover some of the puppy behaviors like housebreaking, play biting and things like that to kind of tide them over. So you could do it that way. Um, and just bypass the puppy program altogether if you do have a weight that's going to push them beyond the puppyhood stage and just sell the adult program from that point because um, you know they're going to be too old for the puppy program by the time they're that you're free anyway. Uh, so you could do it that way. You could also just say, you know, if they really want the puppy program, but you're just not available during the puppyhood stage is just let them know that and say, you know, I would love to help you with the puppy behaviors even after a puppy program, you're still going to want to um, focus on these things, these skills, these behaviors, these goals that you have, um, you know, off leash distractions, whatever it is that you do, and just encourage them to go ahead and plan on that and sell kind of like a whole puppy first year type program that includes your adult programs. And that way they get still some help from you with the puppy stuff or they, and you can say, or, you know, you're welcome to, um, you know, I uh, take this recommendation that I have another trainer that's available now for puppy training and come back for the adult training later on. So there might be a few different ways of doing it. But generally, I would say if you know that your wait list is pushing beyond that, that puppy stage that you go ahead and just sell an adult program at that point um, and just give them some tips on how to handle puppy stuff in the meantime. That's probably how I would handle that. So I hope that helps. Let me know. Give me any follow-up questions if you're like, yeah, but <laughs> what about this? <laughs> just let me know. Can you think of any yeah, but versions of that? Because since Carly's not here to, to yeah, but me. <laughs> um, 
be honest, I wasn't really listening. <laughs> <laughs> She's not listening. She's right here. Who is who is a live audience that actually zones out for a minute? She, but to be fair, Brandy has heard these things probably 5,000 times because she's been listening to me for years. And these are all things that I've said, like in my sleep, probably um, a thousand times, right? <laughs> yes. she, she usually will doodle um, during my webinar. She just listens just to be there and supportive. Um, Tim says, this sounds great. I would love to charge them um, th those kind of prices, but how would you do this in on low income people? I don't live in a big city where money... Um, is to be had. Okay, so that's a great question. When we lived in New Jersey, I was obviously close to a lot of affluent neighborhoods, but that's why I was saying that affluent does not necessarily equal high end and vice versa. So if you want more high end clients with higher end prices, you don't necessarily, at, well, you don't, you don't need to live in a wealthy area at all. So what you need to know is that just like that same friend who says they can't afford to go to lunch with you will go out and buy, you know, the next new iPhone, immediately, you know, everybody values different things. I had people in very, very, very low income neighborhoods that I'd be absolutely shocked. They come to me and they, they, you know, happily do a $3,000 dog training program. And then I'd go to their lesson for a house and think I'm in the wrong place because of just the neighborhood they lived in. Didn't think anything of it. And it's really just because everybody values different things. So if you know how to present things in a way that people value and your ideal clients value it and they understand why it's worth what you're charging, if they're not willing to spend what you're charging, it's almost always a um, communication problem, you know, when it comes to them not understanding the value of why it's worth that much. It's not usually, it's very rarely because you're actually overcharging for your market. That is extremely rare. In fact, I've never actually seen it happen. So I've never actually told anybody to um, lower their prices because their area couldn't handle it. It's always a skill related thing. And say, if you're not get, if you're getting people pushing back about prices, there's something wrong, something going wrong with the program description, the way that you're explaining the value of the program or with your sales process, with what you're actually saying during the consultation. So Brandy's dog is scratching over here if you guys can hear it. <laughs> so um, that is always is the issue is, is this marketing skill related thing and not really because your market can't bear the, pr the prices. So you can definitely get, um, it really depends on how you format your program. So I wouldn't necessarily say go take your four lesson program and go start charging $4,000 for it now. You know, just because other trainers are getting those prices does depend on their skill level as dog trainers with the actual dog training skill what they can accomplish in that amount of time, what they include in the programs um, and how good they are at talking to people. And those are all skills. Those are all marketing skills. And those are the things that I teach. So those are all things that can be learned. So even in lower income areas, you can still have very high value programs that people can choose from. The real trick is making sure that you have options for people to choose from. So you might have a very an expensive program that has the bare minimum that your ideal client would need and a big program that has everything that your ideal client would need plus all the things they might want. And then if you get a low income person that's desperate for your help and really, really tight, but still values what you do, they can pick the small program and still get the things that they need for, you know, a few hundred dollars or something. And then you'll have other people who just extremely value the things that are in your big program and happy to spend three, $4,000 on that program but you have the choices and they can choose based on their preferences of they want more, they pay more. If they want to just get just what they need, they can pay less. And that's, that's basically how that works. Uh, so I hope that gives you uh, some uh, ideas for your potential there. And uh, that it's really just, there's no real secret. It's all just skills. It's all just things you learn. The, the only secret is the stuff you haven't found out yet. <laughs> Everything is figure outable. That is one of my, the Mollyisms that Brandy loves to repeat, um, which I actually stole from Marie For Forleo. Is it Marie Forleo? She's a big like marketing woman, businesswoman, coach person um, that's relatively famous. But she says that everything is figure outable. And I took it from her because it's perfect. It's a Mollyism now. Jenna says, exactly what happened. Perfect answer. And I do offer a guarantee. That's great. Um, a guarantee is one of the things that's on the list of 17 things that you can add to your programs that give it more value. That list of 17 things is under part two of the mini workshop. So you guys make sure you go download that. It's free. 
And it's a list of actual things that dog trainers, including me and many of the dog trainers I've worked with have added to their programs and a, um, any kind of lifetime support guarantee is one of those things that adds huge amounts of value because it gives peace of mind and people are willing to pay for peace of mind. That is one of the, the top three things people are willing to, willing to pay for. What's the other two? You don't remember? <laughs> no. <laughs> the other two things are a uh, better result, meaning their dog listens better around distractions, off leash, just okay. higher level result and more convenience. Okay. Meaning you go to them instead of them coming to you, you do more of the work as in like a board and train program. Yeah. That's why a board and train program is more valuable. It's not because you do more work. It's because they do less work, yeah. <laughs> right? So convenience, peace of mind and results. Those are the three things. I'm a terrible student. <laughs> <laughs> but you make a lot of money. So you're a great student. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so you're welcome, Janet. I'm glad you liked that answer. Rebecca says, do you have any examples of sets of programs, um, tiers that go together? Uh, I do. And um, I think there are some in the videos in, at the, in the mini workshop. But to give you kind of one off the top of my head, something that's very common is that you might have different types of programs and different types of programs obviously are more valuable than other types. So like a board and train program is more valuable than a private lesson program because of the convenience factor. Your bigger programs might also have more of the peace of mind factors like lifetime support or unlimited lessons or unlimited commands. Your bigger programs might also have more exclusivity, meaning maybe you only train one dog at a time in that program if it's like a board and train program. So you can have different size programs of the same type, a small private lesson program, three or four lessons, just the bare minimum of what everybody needs, leash pulling and jumping, and that's it. And then a large program that has more private lessons, but the more time isn't the thing that's valuable. It's the fact that that time gives you more time to get better results. So the better results is the more valuable thing. Um, so it might have eight lessons in it, but you can do, you know, distractions and off leash and place and down and sit and, and wait and, you know, stay automatically and all those things. So better skills, the more time equals that the dog is more reliable and listens in more situations. So that's what's valuable and that's how you describe it. And then it, this program is typically accomplished in eight lessons. First one typically accomplished in three or four lessons, you know, that kind of thing. Um, then you have a medium one that's somewhere in between six lessons and, you know, kind of a medium amount of results. The bigger program would also have more of the peace of mind features. Um, and maybe you go to them instead of them coming to you. Your small one might be three private lessons at your place. The medium one is, um, you know, five private lessons, two of them are at their house and a little bit more with the distractions, a few more commands. The large program might be eight lessons all at their house, lifetime um, uh, support for, you know, refreshers and things like that and uh, unlimited commands. If they wanted to teach something new, they could come to your place to teach it, you know, to have another lesson for that, uh, things like that. So you just uh, mix the, the valuable features that are on that list of 17 things. You have more of them in the bigger programs, even if they're all the same type of program. Another example might be a small private lesson program, a, you know, a, a, a short board and train jumpstart plus private lessons hybrid sort of program, and then a large program that's a longer board and train that includes a higher level of reliability and all these other things. So then you have different program types spread out across the three programs. So it usually works best if you have three programs, small, medium, and large, and they either grow in convenience peace of mind or the actual result with the dog, the reliability or all of the above. And then they get bigger as, as they, as they get bigger. So that is, uh, those are just some examples off the top of my head, but I think there's some more in those videos. So another one, Janet says, I do deposit something correct. <laughs> so congratulations. Good job on that. Make sure it's non-refundable. That is the, the big thing. Everybody makes it misses. If it's not refundable, if it is refundable or you don't do a deposit, you automatically, just human nature, trigger the whole second guessing thing when they go home. Even if they are just full on excited when they talk to you, they go home and automatically it just switches into like, did I do the right thing? Normal human nature psychology. So if you take the deposit, that just stops that whole mental process from even happening. So just do that. Carly says, I'm jumping in and out. I do have a yeah, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
I didn't understand that at first. I forgot that I said that. Uh, puppies are my main focus and specialty aside from aggression cases. And I love working with them. So I want to be able to serve and get people training ASAP sooner rather than later to help prevent potential problems. Okay. So in that case, um, if you are not at the point where you have a wait list, it doesn't matter yet anyway. But um, if you need to get them while they're still young and you don't have availability, then I would say that, hmm, you probably, if you're, so there's a little bit, it's a little bit tricky here because if you are already full, hopefully you're also already meeting your income goals, in which case you're going to have to just start turning away clients if they're going to age out before you have availability. And if that's the case, then hopefully you're still already meeting your income goals and getting plenty of clients. So then you've got the balance already where you have enough clients and enough money and enough time off. If that's not the case, then the waitlisting thing is probably not the big problem to focus on fixing right now. The problem to focus on fixing is why are you booked and still getting clients, but not making enough money or making enough money, but not having enough time off or making enough money and having enough time off, but it's inconsistent. And you're getting a lot of clients one month and none the next because those people aged out uh, before you could get to them or whatever. So there might be another problem. There's like a hole in the business somewhere else that needs to be fixed. And the deposit thing may not be the solution to your particular hole in your business. So um, that, that's where I would focus on, on this particular thing right now is to figure out where exactly the hole is in your business um, that's preventing you from having all of those consistent you know, thriving situations going on. Enough business, enough clients, enough calls coming in consistently so that you have your ideal clients and your specialty before they age out and uh, everything stays consistent. So I hope that makes sense. Kim says, Marie is awesome. <laughs> I don't know who is Marie? <laughs> um, maybe she means Molly. <laughs> I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to Huh? Was it that marketing lady you were telling me? About? Oh, Marie Forleo. Yes, thank you. Yeah, Marie is awesome. That Marie. Yes, Marie is great. <laughs> I mean, you're awesome too. Thank you. <laughs> um, but yes, Marie and Molly are both awesome because we say everything is figure outable. Uh, Tim says, thank you. Makes sense. You're welcome, Tim. Um, someone says, how, how would your program work in a different com country with completely different issues? For example, here, most of the people I know have never looked for a trainer on a website. To be honest, no one uh, I've known for more than 15 years teaching who has searched for on has searched for websites. And this is one of several va variants from completely different countries. I'm from Brazil. So hi, Brazil. Um, nice to have somebody from Brazil here. That's a, really cool. Um, I had someone from Greece on one of my last webinars and um, get people from all over the world. So nice to have you here. And I, a lot of these principles are very, very um, extremely similar all over the world because so much of it is just psychology, like just normal human behavioral psychology, which is one of my favorite things to learn about um, and slip into all of the teachings without being too sciencey. But when it comes to a technological difference, meaning that in your particular culture that there isn't a lot of website usage going on, that really only makes a difference from the advertising side. Everything else that I've tell, told you tonight is all psychology once they contact you. So after they've contacted you and they found you and they know they want help with their dog, then enters these skills where you, you know, have well, the way you have your programs packaged and priced, the way you talk to people, all that stuff comes at that point. So all the website stuff is all from the advertising side, how they actually find you in the first place. And that might be different in Brazil because of just the technology culture. So however they currently find you and are getting in touch with you might be completely different. Um, however you normally would do that is fine. So you in your case may not need a website or worry about website content or any of that stuff because it's different there, but you still need to have the skills of how to package what you offer, how to price it, how to describe it, what words to use, how to talk to people, all those things involved in being able to make more per person. So those are all, all of the stuff is under marketing because it's all having to do with client attraction and how to talk to people and how to get clients and how to make more money, all of that stuff. But the advertising side is just one small piece of marketing. And that that's the thing that's going to be different for you. So however you currently get your, do your advertising, just keep doing it that way if it's working for you. 
Um, so it says, would you like to make an adaptation for my country and for the Portuguese language? It's funny that you say that because I was just talking to a friend a couple days ago about learning Portuguese. So I don't know it yet. Yeah. <laughs> but are you going to? I, I would love to. And I will let you know when, when I know Portuguese and I would be happy to translate the whole course. <laughs> I would love to and I'm going to are two different things. Are you actually going to? I am or actually or going to. Okay. I just don't know how long it's going to take. And I can't make any promises on that because I am very distractible. But I, I will do it. But I just don't know how long it'll take. But yeah, I, I will practice Portuguese with you. Um, or on, on you. <laughs> You can tell me how bad it is very soon. Um, okay, Kim says, Molly, when first starting out with training the basics, um, is it adv advisable to start at a lower price until you can get some cl uh, client testimonials? Not necessarily. If your skills are, are great in terms of the outcome you can give people, charging less for those benefits is really only just an easier way for you to be less uncomfortable. And that's really the only benefit. Um, if they can get the benefits of it and you know how to present it and you know how to talk to people and all that stuff, there's no reason to charge less until you get more testimonials or more confidence or anything else. Um, you have, if you've had any clients already that can give you any kind of testimonials about how, um, you know, your, your skills or how reliable you are, or how the experiences they had, the before and afters with their dogs, all that stuff is great, but having cheaper clients aren't necessarily the best testimonials anyway. And the reason for that is that even, especially people you train for free don't have any skin in the game or people you undercharge to, they just have less invested. So they tend to get less results. And that's just the way it just tends to work out. So if you undercharge um, and you try to get testimonials from those people, they will tend to not take the program as seriously because they didn't pay as much. And then their dog doesn't do as well. And then they're not a really great testimonial. So I would say just be careful about doing it that way, just for the sake of getting testimonials. Um, I would say charge for the, the value of, your, of the benefits and the value of the outcome, no matter how long you have been training. If you're good at what you do, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If you can give people the results, you charge for the value of that result. So I hope that makes sense and that helps. Um, Carly says, I had a wait list before COVID when I was doing in person. Now things are different because I'm currently online only. Yeah, that, that might change your bandwidth and how much you could do per week as well. You might be able to do more or less and it just depends um, or start having hybrid programs where you do some online. Um, you know, the, you can give people the option of like, hey, you know, my next availability is not until your dog's too old for this program. How about if we do a combo program where you do the first four lessons online and we do them sooner and then we do the rest later and it'll be okay that your dog is, you know, aged out at that point. So you could kind of start doing hybrid programs a little bit at this point too. Kim says, I agree, Molly is awesome. <laughs> so Molly and Marie, having cheaper clients is not the best testimonials, boom. So <laughs> I'm glad that was a big aha moment for you, Kim. That's awesome. Uh, all right, let me make sure I didn't miss any questions. I'm at the bottom of my chat box here. Anybody else have any other questions that I can help you with? Oh, Rebecca says, where can I find out more about your program creation workshop? So if you look here, dogtrainerworkshop.com, that is where the registration for the boot camp will be open on Monday. And the program creation workshop is part of that boot camp. It's the first part. First three lessons are the program creation workshop. So it'll be included in that and that will open on Monday. So you're on my list of, you know, if you got this webinar, you're on my email list, you're on my text list, um, and I will make sure you don't forget. You like your bat? I'm going to cough. Hold on guys. <coughs> I start losing my voice. I need like some kind of voice coach. I really, I start losing my voice after an hour these days. Um, bro, drink the throat coat tea. I will drink the throat coat tea. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, bro. Um, let's see. I told you this before. I don't think you listen though. I don't listen. I didn't even listen to myself because I didn't even know who, what, who, what Marie she was talking about. <laughs> um, okay. I figured it out. Thanks to you. I think I got all the questions. Let's see, scroll back down. If we've gone through the workshop, can we do it again? Absolutely. You guys who have ever done the program creation workshop, the make more money workshop or the boot camp, get the new versions every time. So every time there's an update, you get it and you can go through it as many times as you want. Um, obviously opening up registration now means that I'll be doing all new live Q and A's all over again. So you get to join those too. 
and <laughs> watch me be silly um, during these webinars and answer your questions. Not only be silly, it's fun. <laughs> Roger Love, Carrie, thank you. I do know Roger Love. I actually, he's a voice coach. Um, I actually saw him live at a conference and his talk was the funniest thing I've ever seen. He was the best speaker. It was amazing. So yeah, I love, I love Roger Love. Um, he's an awesome voice coach and has a $7 program for sustaining your voice. Thank you for letting me know that. I need to go look that up. I have looked up his stuff a couple times and just never pulled the trigger and got it. He is actually um, the same voice coach for like teaching celebrities how to sing for roles that include singing. He teaches speakers how to keep their, from losing their voice on stage, all kinds of cool stuff. And his presentation was just so hilarious. Um, thank you for that. Thanks for the reminder on him. So, um, if I, so this one says, if I'm not mistaken here in Brazil, we have the three largest digital marketing market, USA and Russia are the first bring your product here. But you know, it's funny that, uh, cause I, I, um, this other program that I did years ago to help teach me how to, how to share knowledge online, which was called, it was a program called product launch formula. And that program is in English and in Portuguese, just the two. So I think he, uh, that somebody in Brazil bought the licensing for that program, product launch formula and launched it there for that very reason. So you're absolutely right. So bring your product here. I know that we have devalue currency. Uh, one Brazilian is worth 17 cents. Wow, that's probably good for Americans though, who visit Brazil. So yeah, that's cool. Uh, if I'm getting that exchange rate the right direction, yeah, when I learn Portuguese, I'll get there. Uh, the launch formula is probably what it's called there in Brazil. Yeah, it, here it's PLF, product launch formula. So that's interesting. Okay, any other questions from you guys? Just gonna scroll back up and show you the steps again. Uh, focus on getting fewer clients. Charge what, uh, change what you offer and charge what you're worth. Don't charge by the hour or by the session or just for your time in general. And keep your boundaries. Work-life balance, it's all about that. I have no work-life balance this week because of the mini workshop. Brandy has been here and she has seen me running around like a maniac. I like, you're part of the reason there's no balance. There's no balance because <laughs> she's like, please come sit by me. <laughs> and then I come and sit by her and we watch videos of parrots talking and ravens talking. And then I'm like, okay, I gotta go. I gotta go send, you know, like a hundred text messages and, like, and oh, an email <laughs> and record another video. And uh, yeah, I have no boundaries and no balance at all during pre uh, during the um pre but pre workshop free training stuff it's just madness here it's madness so <laughs> thank you guys for being here um kim says as always great information molly you're welcome kim and thank you i appreciate compliments that's part of my personality type so molly loves praise i molly loves praise molly thrives on positive reinforcement <laughs> yes positive reinforcement i also work for treats can I click or train you? She can click or train me. <laughs> yeah. So thank you guys again um, for being here. And I really appreciate, yes, it's um, Erica. Yeah, that's the guy. Thank you. That's who I was talking about, the guy in Brazil. Thank you guys so much for being here. Tim says, thank you so much. You were the best. I appreciate it. I got a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Brandy guys just gave me this bracelet. It's beautiful in Morse code. So that was a great compliment. I have a compliment right here all the time now. Yeah. So, yep. Thank you guys again. I will let you guys go and I will talk to you soon. I'll send out this recording to all of you as well. And uh, make sure you stay in touch. Any questions, make sure you go to this, make it as a dog to see the free mini workshop and dog trainer workshop um, dot com on Monday to get into the full big workshop, the boot camp, to get even more help from me if you'd like. So, looking forward to seeing you guys there. He says, thank you, Molly. You're an amazing teacher. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, you could just, you could just ask. You don't have to fish for compliments. You can just say, hey, praise. That works too. Really? See you guys later. Thanks again. <laughs> Bye.